Hi, welcome to Philly Jazz Talks. I'm Suzanne Cloud, Project Director of the Philadelphia Jazz Legacy Project. This evening, we're going to be talking um, to three, three people who are very, very, very important to the great, late, great guitarist, Pat Martino. And um, it, it's going to be quite an evening. I'm very, very um, anxious and happy and, and expectant about the whole thing. So I'm sure you are too. But before we get to that, and before I get to the introductions, it's important that you know that these jazz talks are brought to you by the Philadelphia Jazz Legacy Project. We're an organization whose mission is to establish a permanent jazz archive for Philadelphia and Philadelphia area jazz artists and the community at large through recordings, video interviews, manuscripts, material culture, like photographs, programs, posters, anything that relates to Philly jazz and its history. When I'm talking about Philly, I'm talking about down the shore. I'm talking about Wilmington and I'm talking about Trenton. So it's all encompassing. I'd also like to thank uh, the Philadelphia Cultural Fund for partially sponsoring these talks. Without their help, these programs would not be possible. I also want to thank the people who support us with their donations and to the attendees who have supported us throughout um discussing these topics about philadelphia jazz is very very dear to us and it preserves history in the moment and so this is something that goes on our uh, youtube channel so people can look back on this way after we're gone <laughs> and and see what we were talking about but we appreciate your help very 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 much i also um want tell you if you to get a reminder of our events and the other Philly jazz legacy work that we're doing you can go to our website at phillyjazzhistory.org and sign up for our monthly newsletter so now to introduce tonight's guests first we have guitarist John Mulhern and he studied with Pat Martino from 1979 to 1996 and studied with Dennis Sandoli, very important mentor to many musicians, including Coltrane. He stu uh, John studied uh, with him from 1986 to 1988. Um, Mul Mulhern uh, lived with Pat Martino in LA and was with him when he had his aneurysm in 1980, which totally changed the direction of his life. John was the house guitarist for the Golden Nugget Orchestra from 1984 to 1990, playing for Sarah Vaughn, Billy Eckstein, Harry Connick Jr., The Fifth Dimension, Shirley Bassey, and Vinnie Falcone, who's the pianist and conductor for Frank Sinatra. John Mulhern has played Radio City Music Hall, Lincoln Center in New York, Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and every single casino in Atlantic City and Las Vegas. Welcome, John. I'm glad you're here tonight. Well, thanks a lot, Suzanne. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Next, we have uh, author Bill Milkowski. He's a longtime contributor to almost every magazine, music magazine in the world, like Downbeat, Jazzy. All of them, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Guitar player, um, Jazz Times, bass player, modern drummer, swing journal. He, he has written over 900 sets of liner notes and over 7,000 articles for various magazines. He is also the author of eight books. Jaco, The Extraordinary and tra uh, Tragic Life of Jaco Pistorius, Rockers, Jazz Bows and Visionaries, Swing It, An Annotated History of Jive, Legends of Jazz, Keith Richards, A Rock and Roll Life, and uh, the book that he'll be probably reaching for tonight is Here and Now, his book, which was the autobiography of Pat Martino. His latest uh, has gotten rave reviews. <laughs> it's an ode to the tenor titan, the life and times and music of Michael Brecker. Wow. He's, won he's won many awards um, for his writing, uh, and he's also received the Jazz Journalist Association Lifetime Achievement Award in 2011. He's also the recipient of the 2015 Bruce Lundvall Award presented by the Montreal, Montreal Jazz Festival. So welcome, Bill. Thank you. 
<laughs> Last but certainly not least is Joe D'Onofrio. In addition to being Pat Martino's longtime manager, he has 60 years experience as a musician, manager, promoter, and producer. He's an award-winning music producer with 12 Grammy nominations and six Grammy Awards. And he's the art artistic director of the South <laughs> Jersey Jazz Society. He's a 25 year member of the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences and a cult consultant for BMI publisher and uh, music and entertainment. He's got scads of clients. And in addition to being um, a very, in addition to being Pat Martino's manager, he was also one of Pat Martino's closest, closest friends. And he's also organizing this huge celebration of life for Pat uh, down down the shore, and he'll be talking about that tonight. So welcome, Joe. Thank you. All right. Well, let's get get going. I'm going to turn to uh, to John. And oh, we got a lot of folks here tonight. Wow. Okay. Um, John Mulhern, you started off. Tell me about how you met Pat and uh, when you guys, why you kind of, you know, were able to uh, become friends and all that kind. Start it off. Well, and let's make the main person. I'm, I'm getting a Joe in the main window instead of John. Okay. Can you see me now? Yeah, there we go. Okay. I, uh, when I was, um, I guess, uh, 18 years old, I worked, walked into Grendel's lair. Uh, and I just heard this music. I never heard anything like this music, uh, this guitar playing. Um, and I, uh, you know, I'm the oldest of seven kids and my, uh, you know, Pat was an only child, and it was kind of uh, crazy that I would go into this club, and I I went in there, and I uh, Pat was like my um, older brother. Uh, you know, he treated me like that. One thing I got to say about Pat is he treated me like family. Uh, we were family. We weren't just friends and stuff like that, but. Uh, I walk into Grendel's lair, I hear this music. Uh, I went up to him and I, after the performance, and I said, I just got to ask you one question. I said, it was almost like you were outside your body <laughs> uh, while, you, while you were playing. And, you know, with a little smile, he says, uh, yeah, I was on the other side of the light booth watching myself play. <laughs> and I go, dude, you've got to teach me how to do that. I want to learn how to do that. <laughs> and he was just like, uh, he had so much energy and so much, um, uh, he was just amazing uh, as a person. You know, he, he did things, if you look at his signature, if you look at his playing, you know, his time, there wasn't anybody that was, was even close as far as I was concerned. Uh, I studied with him, uh, and uh, I recorded him in my basement studio along, uh, it was like in the, uh, I guess, early 70s or late 70s, and, you know, I'm trying to get some of these tapes that I have, uh, you know, um, get them prepared to, you know, digitize them and things like that, but he would be, he, Pat always did stuff on the moment. He didn't really practice the thing. He would just, he says all the time for me, when we were recording, he said, just run the tape, man. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll worry about the, you know, what we're gonna do. Har hardly had anything to do with editing. You know, he just wanted to his sound and me to capture his sound. All right. Well, John, before you go further, uh, I wanted to play for everybody who's here tonight uh, a video that kind of demonstrates his facility on uh, on the guitar and whatnot. And then we can go into the Grendel's Lair gig that you guys
got you put together the music we're going to hear later on okay okay no problem all right go ahead lex play play that video i'm specifically concerned about the music itself the moment itself all of this unified into an experience called now when i perform i am not giving any thought whatsoever to what comes next but once the performance begins anything could happen pat martino and friends The idea that he had to relearn his craft from scratch is a myth that swiftly grew around him. I never thought it stacked up neurologically, but it's a beautiful myth. You want to believe it. The great virtuoso, silenced, stripped of his virtuosity, who takes up the guitar again, studying the recordings of a great master, his former self. Virtuosity entails much more than physical dexterity. It demands deep knowledge and passion. That's what Pat had lost. And my hunch is that it wasn't so much that Pat rediscovered the music as that the music rediscovered him. It's almost as if his guitar playing bridges the gaps in his brain. Maybe that's what music does, enables the cross-connection of thought and emotion. Identity is something that, that has many different masks and many different faces. And I think the greatest identity of all that I've experienced so far is internal. One thing that was for sure at all times was the excitement of jazz, the artists, you know, and what surrounded it. <laughs> Wes Montgomery came over to us, I think at the bar. Came over to the bar and he was just so cordial as if he already knew, knew us. My, both my mom and dad were just taken by it. And um, I was stunned. From that point forward, there was a split in my intentions and, and what the guitar meant to me. The instrument that he was a master of left on stage. And the true nature of why he was there was standing right before me. His heart his compassion, his concern. And there, there was a separate definition of two things, two sides of the same coin. And one side of the coin was stardom, and the other side was legacy. To be a legend, I saw a choice between the two, and that affected me. To this very day, uh, from the very beginning, my intentions were always to enjoy the moment. And I know that most children uh, are like that. So to give you an answer as to my beginning, with the guitar and with music as a dedication, I, I feel that it's an, a necessity to begin with what I enjoyed the most, and that was playfulness to be able to play with my favorite toy. In retrospect, I think of all, the, of all the things that have caught my attention, the guitar has been the most magnetic. years one of the beef cutters said hey you know what that fellow that we always talk to in the back he's a celebrity he's somebody famous so the next time Pat came in we all jumped on him how come you didn't tell us very modestly said oh you know didn't think that I had to tell you anything like that because we liked him already so he didn't have to prove anything to us and we found out the reason that he is the way he is because here was a man who 
was not supposed to be here, who was not supposed to be well. He was sent home, his father thought, because he only had hours to live. And a man who overcame all of that because of his faith and his strong belief. And I think we all admire him and we all respect him. Not only because of that, because of the person that he is. He's just a gentle soul. He's just one of the guys from South Philly. He's really cool. You know, Pat is really, really cool, but he, he has this um, knowledge in uh, vocabulary like Wayne Shorter and Coltrane. He, he, he can go there. You know, I was feeling pretty good about myself uh, when I was 19 <laughs> years old and I came to New York and everybody was raving about me as a player. They were saying, yeah, I heard about you. You're that new guitar player that played with Jack McDuff. Yeah, I sure can't wait to hear you play, man. They say you're a bad cat. And then I was feeling good and I was out on the town thinking I had conquered New York. And I walked into uh, Small's Paradise and saw this young kid on the guitar thinking, oh, what is he going to do? I should get up there and show him how to play. And all of a sudden, they came to a break in the music and this guitar leaped out of nowhere, playing some of the most incredible lines I had ever heard. <laughs> had everything in it, great tone, great articulation and uh, the whole crowd in there, it was a black audience. They went crazy and I said to myself, if this is a sample of what New York is like, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> He's totally in the line of historical, very, very influential guitarists in the world of jazz. He's, he's one that will go down in the history books, obviously. When I hear Pat in free flow, that's what I feel, is just that he's, he's just flying and, that, and, that, and swooping, and, that there's a, a, and that that's a delightful thing to be able to do as a musician. You become, over the years, well-tempered, you know, uh, to use Johann Sebastian Bach's words. You become well-tempered, and in the process, you then begin to consciously decide what you want to do with the power that the craft has given you, it's both socially and artistically. And by doing so, you refine your life and your intentions as well. And that, to me, is, uh, in my opinion, the, uh, the nexus of all forms of art the refinement of the enjoyment of life, of living. I don't want to be something I used to be. I want to learn from what I experience. And I want it to refine my life. Let me hear it end right there. That was a film by Jason Fifield from uh, S-Life uh, Productions. and. I'll tell you, you had him pegged, John, because you said he was in the moment, and that's that's where he stayed, and he definitely acknowledged that in, in this film we just saw. Talk talk a little bit about, can you give us a little bit of idea, because you were with him when he had his aneurysm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I was, uh, I had uh, went to GIT with him, which is the Guitar Institute of Technology. He was teaching there. And uh, I was staying uh, in his apartment with him, living with him. And I was on uh, the outside, uh, not his bedroom, but uh, it was like a couch. So I was sleeping on the couch. And I just, uh, you know, I would drive him in a Pinto uh, to score, to school. Uh, and, you know, it was a great, uh, uh, school. I mean, it was everybody who was there, uh, Tommy Tedesco, Howard Roberts. I mean, the elite of guitarists was in this place. And uh, I never had a really a camera uh, at that time. There weren't cell phones, so I never really got any good pictures. Uh, but uh, I just, uh, I remember one night he was, uh, he was getting these headaches and uh, they weren't uh, really normal headaches. You know, they were, you know, pretty lethal. And uh, I remember going into Louise, who was his girlfriend, was in the other bedroom or with the bedroom with him. And she said, come on in here. 
uh, you better, uh, you know, he's bobbing up and down like this on the bed. And uh, she grabbed his tongue and I grabbed him and his tongue. We, we just held him down so we wouldn't swallow his tongue. And then uh, the next morning, I think he went to Cedar, Cedar Sinai and uh, they basically gave him like 40 hours to live or something like that. And he called his dad uh, and, he, and his dad said, you're not going to get uh, uh, you're not going to get operated on in, in Los Angeles, come home to Philadelphia, uh, to uh, University of Pennsylvania. And I was kind of, you know, scared because he, you know, uh, if, if it's an aneurysm, the blood vessel could go, would burst in the plane, you know, just from the pressure. And it didn't, came home, uh, got a, uh, uh, an operation by this great doctor at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, they found out that it was a, a you know, a blood vessels in his brain, like a, a little or a bunch of, of them all messed up like a, a, a ball or something like that. You know, there was a, so he fixed it uh, and you know, he was kind of like, you know, very, uh, very out of it as far as uh, didn't want to play, didn't want to do anything. Did and, he recognize you when you when he saw you? Uh, not at, at first, but the second time when Mickey, Mickey, his father called me and said, John, he never, uh, he looks at the guitar, but he doesn't want to play. And I said, well, uh, uh, I was working at, as a house guitar player at the Gold Nugget Orchestra, so I had like Monday and Tuesdays off. And I went down there at Mickey's request and I played him the, these things. He said, why don't you just come down and play him some stuff and, you know, like you used to do in my basement. And that's what I did. I went down and I had had this book that was always Pat's, um, uh, it was always Pat's, uh, 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 things, you know, 12, uh, 12 uh, key centers and everything was based on 12. And I said to him, and he used to get mad at me because I used to say, uh, don't you remember, uh, I'm, I'm major, you're minor. I'm happy, you're sad. And I used to play this stuff in Los Angeles. And when I went to Pat, I started talking to him about uh, this major seventh. The major seventh and the minor ninth is the same uh, uh, thing, uh, 120, uh, 114 key centers or 24 key centers. You can, it's a different uh, base note. So it's his really theory. And he used to go and say, ah, sort of like, you'll never amount to anything, you know, <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you play it like I taught you how to play it? And I said, I don't hear like that. I hear major, you hear minor, I hear happy, you hear sad. <laughs> and that was the key to when I went with this book. Uh, I went to his uh, apartment and I was on the second floor in his study and I brought out this book. And I, uh, I started playing through the, these things. But I said, this is how you did it in minor nines. Uh, and this is how I did it in major sevens. It was more like um, melodic type of things. Pat was very dark. And a lot of his uh, playing is, is very dark. And he looked at the guitar. The guitar is over here on this side. And... Uh, I had a, 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 um, um, an ovation that I brought that he had given me. And so he got that guitar and he says, move over and play that. And I played the changes <laughs> and immediately like that, he started playing. Oh. And, and it was amazing to me that, you know, he just, uh, I don't know, maybe he was so mad at me 
from Los Angeles that it, I opened up something. I opened up a key to his brain and man, he was, he was like Pat, the old Pat Martino. I mean, he, All right, well, I, I, let me, let me stop you there talking about the old Pat Martino. Let's, I want you to go back now when you first saw him at Grendel's lair and before Lex, our tech guy puts on the, uh, the three or four minutes of uh, uh, music that he played at Grendel's Lair. Give us some background to what we're going to hear, John. Yeah. Uh, he had put, uh, the day that I went there it was 1974. Uh, he had uh, played uh, with um, this quartet. I think Gil Goldstein was there. Uh, that's what's on that uh, clip. Uh, the one thing that he did play that he must have played a solo on a Sonny for, I don't know, 16 choruses. And every chorus, it was just better than <laughs> the last course. And, you know, again, so much energy and so much uh, feeling that, uh, and then this uh, song, Olio, you know, he uh, plays and it was, Everything he played was just amazing. I mean, you, if, if you listen to it, there's not anybody that plays like him. There's nobody that sounds like him as far as I'm concerned. All right, so let me, Lex, do you want to put uh, the music? This is from the Grendel's Lair gig, which they recorded and released, right? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Lex. <laughs> <laughs> That's otherworldly. What can I say? <laughs> really? Oh, John. That's so. Now I can see why you just like were totally drawn to him and everything with that kind of plan going on. I'm going to bring. I'd like to bring in Bill right now. Bill Milkowski. May I say, if that's what George Benson heard that night, <laughs> I know why he left town. <laughs> you dig? Come on, man. Whoa. That ain't. That just ain't fair. Yeah, <laughs> really. And that was 1974, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Man. Uh, you know, seeing that previous video of Pat talking, he not only 
articulated on the instrument like no one else. He did so verbally. Hearing him talk and express his ideas about what he's doing is similarly otherworldly. And just the way that he expressed himself verbally was equally impressive and virtuosic. I agree. Well, what would you say, uh, Bill? You know, um, Lex, put up the the, the book cover uh, of Bill's book on uh, Pat. Yeah. Here, here and now. now how, how did you go about writing that, Bill? And and could it's was it at, at kind of an as told to book, or was it exactly? It was okay. uh, written in Pat's voice. It is indeed the autobiography of Pat Martino. It's him speaking, I was his uh, Boswell, so to speak. I came over to his <laughs> house on many occasions and interviewed him in his uh, living room on his couch. We would sit for three and four hours at a time. Uh, I would sort of uh, jog his memory about different things and interject to pull his um, attention back on to certain scenes. Uh, Joe D'Onofrio was really involved in getting instrumental and in getting me involved in this project. Um, he and Pat both sort of uh, agreed that I would be uh, helpful in helping Pat tell his story. And uh, so for me, it was a great pleasure to hear him reminisce about his uh, incredible career. And it's just, I mean, you know, it, it's interesting that Pat and Jocko, who I wrote a book about, and Mike Brecker were all preternaturally talented people, gifted from a very early age, and uh, went on this incredible musical journey. Uh, Pat's father was taking him around, and this is why it's such a Philly story, and it's so appropriate for this particular venue tonight, because, uh, you know, Pat's father was a sort of would-be guitar player who had interestingly taken lessons with Eddie Lang in the neighborhood in South Philly, oh. uh, Salvatore Massaro. He took a couple of weeks of lessons with him and then uh, bought Pat a, a Les Paul gold top when he was 12 and noted how gifted he was and began, you know, prideful father, taking his son around to the barber shop down on 13th Street and saying, uh, hey, my kid can play, check it out. And Pat would play <laughs> Moonlight in Vermont, which was a great uh, hit by his hero, uh, Johnny Smith, who had done a recording of it with uh, Stan Getz. Um, so, you know, he was like pushing Mickey, his father was pushing Pat onto the stage at that early age and around Philly. And uh, man, by the time he was 16, he was already on the road with Lloyd Price playing in a big band with like uh, veterans like Jimmy Heath and Slide Hampton and uh, Curtis Fuller, Benny Golson, Red Holloway. And, you know, this is where he got a lot of his depth. And by the time he went to Harlem uh, as a teenager and began playing with uh, Willis Gator Tail Jackson, this cat was fully formed. And, you know, maybe some of what we just heard on that recording he was playing at Small's Paradise the the night that George Benson entered, you know, <laughs> having heard it from the street, like, oh, who's that? Check it out. And it's like, what? This little white kid? What can he do? And he had proceeded to blow him away. Yeah. Uh, and of course, they were friendly rivals, uh, both sort of heirs to West Montgomery's throne, along with Grant Green. And they sort of had this triumvirate of... Uh, three guitar players, you know, who were taking it someplace else after Wes. But I think what Pat was doing was, man, um, that that recording that we just heard was stunning. And my first audio encounter with hearing Pat uh, on that Consciousness album from 1974, right out of the gate, playing impressions on the opening track, that was stunning and captivating and compelling uh, at any guitar player at that period who was maybe weaned on uh, Barney Kessel and maybe Joe Pass heard something new. This was a fresh take on that tradition, that hard bop, coming out of that hard bop thing, but this whole uh, accelerated thought process and uh, 
the jumping off the cliff motif the, with his <laughs> ideas and his sense of daring from moment to moment. It was it was really something else. And it really uh, galvanized a generation of guitar players. So how do you think um, Pat will be remembered down through the years, uh, b besides being a total, total virtuoso? How do you think? Well, you, yeah. You know, his gifts aside, those who met him felt the warmth of his character and his personality. And he was like a teacher and a Zen master, but he was also from the hood. So he had a streetwise <laughs> sense of humor. He combined all of these things into one incredible uh, charismatic being. Uh, I think he uh, affected anyone who met him, not merely from his virtuosity, but from the depth of his soulfulness as a human being, the way he lived and the wisdom that he imparted when he spoke to you. I think every one of the guys playing at that upcoming uh, celebration in Jersey in November, uh, not only got from Pat the notes, but they got the depth of his uh, personality and uh, his humanness. They all were affected in some way by Pat, the human being who was like the, the deepest cat that I ever met. Yeah. Now, one last question before we bring Joe into it. How would you say his playing changed or did it change from before the aneurysm and then after the aneurysm? Um, you know, in some ways, Pat was playing catch up with himself. Uh, John can attest to this. You know, Mickey was downstairs playing Pat's old records to sort of try to jog his memory. At the same time, Pat had no relationship with the instrument and was having to uh, renegotiate that uh, by reclaiming memory. Uh, and as he did reclaim memory and facility, you know, what we heard on that tape or any of his, uh, even like the Young Guns record uh, with Gene Ludwig from 1968 or El Hombre or Strings or any of those early recordings uh, by Ina. Um, the facility is so clean and so off the charts technically that to try to reclaim that or have that, he's in competition with himself now, he was coming back gradually. When you listen to, uh, there was a 12 year gap between uh, Joyous Lake and The Return. When you uh, hear The Return, it's Pat, but it's a little, it, it's not that killing in a terms of absolute searing facility. He was playing catch up a little bit with himself and gradually over time uh, reclaimed his prowess. I think by the time that we hear him playing with uh, Joey DeFrancesco and Billy Hart at Yoshi's, it's like, whoa, that's that's the old Pat, he's back. <laughs> he's definitely back. And from that point on, he sort of reclaimed that glory. But um, I had mentioned this before with Joe talking earlier, there was a new appreciation for ballads, I think, and he dealt with uh, Blue and Green or Around Midnight or uh, You Don't Know What Love Is uh -huh. with a newfound depth that maybe was a profound statement about this journey that he had come through, this fire that he had come through. And he imbued all that into every note in playing ballads. So after the aneurysm, whereas Previous, I was so dazzled by his just absolutely scintillating technique and speed and drive and kinetic energy. After the aneurysm, I came to appreciate his embracing each note in a newfound deep way that maybe he was before, but I didn't hear it. I was so dazzled by the speed and the facility, but I came to appreciate his new relationship with the instrument that to me was more soulful and meaningful. There was more space between the notes and he really brought to it a new depth of meaning, maybe for himself, but certainly for me as a listener. 
Wow. Um, Joe, I'd like to bring, well, I wanted to mention to everybody that Bill's going to be at the celebration, which uh, he's going to be the primary MC, right? Keynote speaker. Keynote speaker. Okay. Go ahead, Joe. Tell us about what you, you, what you planned. You poured your heart and soul into it. Well, first, I must tell you, I'm so taken up listening to Bill. Uh, wonderful, Bill. Just Thank you. You collect. You can tell the guy affected me in a deep way. It's Absolutely. a hard thing. Yes. It's a hard thing with Pat. Yes. And uh, I'm impressed. Listen, we have a great event. Um, you know, I listening to John and, and Bill, I'd love to hear that point of view. I come from a different side, managing Pat. It'll be 25 years in January that we were together. And, uh, well, so this aggregation that we're, we put together here for this celebration, I think, will say it all. And on Thursday, we, we have our first night um, at Gateway Theater in Summers Point, New Jersey, so. And that's, oh, what, Lex, do you want to put up the poster so uh, people can see who's going to be there? Can you, I, I guess you can't make that any bigger, can you? Oh, it looks good. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. Maybe, all right. And, and some of the players, we couldn't fit them all on, but you could see some of them. And so Thursday, we're kind of doing a little um, about uh, tipping our hat to Live at Blues Alley. And we have some of the musicians that were on that. CD. Uh, Tony Monaco on organ, Eric Alexander on sax, Jeff Tane Watts on drums, and Howard Paul will be playing. And also we have Chico Pinheiro from Brazil that's guesting with us and Wolf Marshall. That is the first set. They will all wow. be playing. Yeah. <laughs> Second set. Now, and Bill could speak to some of this, because he did the liner notes for Fareed Hawk's new CD. It's a tribute to Joyous Lake. So Fareed Hawk is bringing in his band from Chicago and he will play probably 30, 40 minutes. And then he's gonna call up to the stage, Kenwood Denard, who was the original drummer of Joyous Lake. With uh, Eric Alexander, who played on Stone Blue, which is was a tip of the hat to Joyous Lake as well. So they will come and guest with Fareed Hawk. So I'm excited about that. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, and uh, before I ask Bill to say something about Fareed, uh, it will we will close Thursday night with a gentleman from Greece, Leftoris Christoph, and he's coming in and he's going to play a solo for the last piece of the evening both sides now, which kind of relate to Bill who did the CD yeah, that uh, that was performed on by uh, Cassandra Wilson, actually. Mm. But Bill, do you want to talk a little bit about Fareed? Fareed is a complete disciple of Pat um, on so many levels. Uh, the swinging organ group level, he's done some recordings of his own uh, with Tony Monaco. Uh, that are in that vein, hard bop, just killing and burning. But uh, Joyous Lake is another animal. That is a, sort of a game changer for people that were involved or becoming interested in fusion music in 1977, the same year that Weather Report released Heavy Weather. That sort of galvanized a whole audience of people and Pat's Joyous Lake was right in that number. Uh, so that also captured the imagination of Fareed. So he's coming to town with a group that is, it's, he's not just covering that music, which in itself was extraordinary and unique and uh, a new chapter, a new door opening in the, the whole continuum of jazz guitar, but he's adding his own flavors to it by uh, incorporating tabla and bringing out uh, some of those elements some of which Pat had exper experimented with himself on Baena in 1968. He had uh, tambora and, and uh, tabla and that sort of east-west thing long before John McLaughlin was Shakti. Um, and so uh, 
Farid is going to sort of enhance that quality about it. But I think he's, I believe that he's playing acoustic guitar steel string rather than uh, electric as Pat played on that original recording, just as some kind of contrast. Um, it should be incredibly exciting. I, I've heard this music that he's recorded and it's it's really scintillating. It's in that spirit, but Fried's putting his own stamp on it. So, uh, you know, stay tuned for that. Uh, and we should also say, Joe, that all of the proceedings are going to be uh, live streamed for people to watch anywhere uh, around the world. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that want to tune in to see the likes of uh, Dave Stryker, Mark Whitfield, Russell Malone, Cheryl Bailey, on and on. Paul Bollenbach. These are all disciples of Pat, and they're coming to bring that gift that Pat gave them and put it out there and give it to us. So the continuum is it, it goes on and this music is uh sounds as fresh and exciting today as it did uh, when pat first recorded it it's amazing lineup you, that you got together here joe and i know how hard you yeah. worked on it now just so so it's going to be november thursday november 4th yeah and i would like to mention you know friday if i if we have time sure keep going <laughs> yeah, so on friday is is uh, that's we're paying tribute to that little time period where Pat came back and Jim Riddle came on uh, with Return, Interchange, and The Maker. He played on those CDs. So Jim Riddle will play the first set of Friday. Uh, he'll have Byron Landon, who played with Pat on drums, uh, Steve Varner on bass, and um, Cheryl Bailey will be playing with him. Wonderful. Uh, oh, and Michael Pettison. Michael played with Pat for a while on tour, and he's going to be playing in that first set as well. So after that first set, we have a wonderful um, a, a group of musicians. Rick Germanson is going to be on piano, and two fabulous guitar players are going to join him, Russell Malone and Jimmy Bruno. I think that's the first time they played together mm. that I know of. So I think that's going to be exciting. And then uh, Joel Harrison will play, uh, Craig Thomas on bass, uh, Byron Landham on drums, and then uh, our friend John Malhern yeah. and David O'Rourke are going to come out and do a duet. And they will actually close the night uh, on Tuesday. So we're excited about that. And plus, we have a surprise announcement that we're going to make uh, on on Friday as well concerning Pat and the Berkeley School of Music. So we'll let you stay tuned for that. Okay. On Saturday, oh oh, and late night on Thursday, I I, I forgot to mention we have uh, players that are locally uh, in our local area that also had strong ties with Pat, and that would be uh, Ishan Kasani. John Mulhern's going to play on that. Um, uh, Michael Kraft, Richard Shepard, uh, Richard uh, and Robert Budessa, uh, Bob Sterling, and Gino White. Gino Wright's not a jazz player. He's a rock player, but he, he was Pat's road manager, I don't know, 10, 12 years. So I said, Gino, what are you going to play? He said, I'm going to play some rock. <laughs> I'm going to do it over with blues. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And Gino's excited. And late night on Friday is going to be an old fashioned jam session. Tony Monaco on organ, Carmen and Tori on drums, and whomever wants to come and play. And I know Bill Milkowski will be sitting in. It's going to be right up his alley. <laughs> Well, I'll have to. I'll be sitting in too. Then I guess. Well, you're 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 right. you're, you're, you're <laughs> on uh, you're on Friday. Yeah, I'm, I'm with uh, Jimmy Bruno. Yeah, in fact, good. I'm doing a song that uh, I asked Pat, one of his songs. In fact, I heard it for the first time when I was with you at Chris's, Joe. Uh -huh. And uh, I said, oh, my goodness, that's a singable song. And I wrote lyrics to it. And I asked him if I could write lyrics. And he said, sure, go ahead. And so that's what I'm going to do. OK, so you, good. I'm, I'm, you got ahead of me. I was going to surprise everybody with that oh. one. 
Anyway, right. okay, so on Saturday, it's going to be Pat Martino's last um, group that he, he had for uh, eight and a half years, something like that. Um, Pat Bianca and Carmen and, Carmen and Tori, who um, were with him for, uh, like I said, eight and a half years. And they're going to do the tribute to his last CD, which is Forbidable. Formidable had two horn players, so we will have Alex Norris, who played on the CD on trumpet, and uh, guesting on sax will be Nicole Glover, up-and-coming sax player. She's fabulous. And then the second set is going to be a, a barn burner with uh, both Carmen and Bianchi uh, holding the fort down for Dave Stryker. Uh, Rodney Jones, Jonathan Kriegsberg. They're not announced. They were just newly placed on this list. So oh, that's really? the announcement for tonight. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy about both Rodney and Jonathan Kriegsberg. And tell everybody tonight. that if you're coming to the concerts personally, it's free. Oh, it's a free concert, um, but you have to get your tickets. You have to go online and get your tickets. You can't get in the door without a ticket. We had to somehow monitor how many people were going to come so we didn't you know have people disappointed that they couldn't get a seat so you have to go online get your ticket it's free and then when you come you're guaranteed a seat so thank you uh, Suzanne I was forgetting that as well uh, late night Saturday uh, second set I said mentioned Dave Stryker Mark Whitfield Barry Green and Byron Landon's going to sit in as well and uh, Rodney Jones, Jonathan Kriegsberg, could you get any better than that? <laughs> Sunday, our brunch is sponsored by Benedetto Guitars and Howard Paul will put some of his Benedetto artists to work playing the brunch from noon to three. And that will conclude our tipping of the hat to Mr. Pat Martino. Uh, I can't tell you, um, what this means to me personally, because after all those years, um, having Pat leave us and we couldn't officially have any kind of service because of COVID, it's very, mm -hmm. it was very hard. And this is a way, I know, especially for all of us, dude, we couldn't go see Pat a lot uh -uh. You know, with COVID. We didn't want to pass that on to him. so. This is, uh, I'm excited and it's heartfelt and all these players coming in to play for Pat is spectacular. And I hope a lot of people tune in for it. I think it's gonna be exciting. And we have Bill Milkowski who's gonna run the show for us and look at how informative he is. He's gonna <laughs> tell us a lot about these acts, a lot about Pat and I'm excited. So, Please yeah, come. I think I'm sure there's going to be a lot of stor stories being told throughout the whole celebration. Yeah, well, we had uh, people like um, uh, uh, who people who cut Stanley Clark. He just sent in today. He said he sent something in. Uh, Lee Rittenauer. A, a lot of musicians are sending in these little 30, 40, 50 second clips that we're going to be playing throughout the night. Well, you can hear what they have to say about them. Some are funny, you know, <laughs> and some are very poignant. But uh, our friend Jason is putting the video together, thanks to uh, Suzanne Cloud recommending him. And he's sensational. He put yeah. that video we watched together. So I'm excited. We'll have, um, how about this? Barney Fields. High note, that was Pat's label. He's coming in. Oh. Uh, yeah, Don Lukoff, who did all the publicity for us, gratis. He did he did it all for. He's coming in. Oh, that'll be nice. All right, now we yeah. have some questions now for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Let me get. Let me get. Let me. Uh, well, we have. Uh, this is from a Mike uh, Paschal, I think. Pat has so many live recordings from Chris's Jazz Cafe. Will Mark uh, at Chris's and the family release any of these sets? I guess that goes to you, Joe. <laughs> no, they can't unless this, his estate, um, you know, uh, gives permission. Uh, they were never granted permission to release it, but 
who knows? We may get together and have a nice CD coming right out of Chris's. Oh, that uh, would so be. Wonderful. I don't know. We've never we've never discussed it. In I'm hearing this for the first time. It's a good idea. And uh, maybe so are those want to that John has. John's well, teaching. Well, yeah, I, I got to tell you, I have. I don't know how many boxes in my, in the corner here of, of of different kinds and different sizes tapes. I'm going to have to have them baked. They're old. A lot of it came from John and from uh, Paul Bagan, who was Pat's road manager for years. Uh, before he had passed, before he passed, he sent me over a lot of um, unreleased material. So Let's we have talk a lot about of it. getting a grant for this getting them professionally digitized. We can, we can get that, we can do that. Okay. Um, all right, here's, the, here's, the, here's another question. Will there be a social event after the Thursday concert? And that's from Charlie Apicella. Yeah, Charlie Apicella, I'm so sorry, Charlie, you're reminding me because you gotta <laughs> forgive me. At 78 years old, sometimes I, I, I miss things. And I miss Charlie's gonna be playing with us on Friday. He's doing two great songs. Um, uh, he's doing, uh, uh, and Charlie, I'm so sorry, I can't remember the two tunes you're doing when we talk today, but he's going to be performing on Friday night with uh, Rick Germanson and uh, Byron Landon. And uh, I'm sorry, Charlie, I, I, I left that out. And I, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to blank and I'm going to have to have a blanket apology at the end of this whole thing. Uh, oh, well, you, you had know, so much uh, to do with this. Jo I mean, Joe, well, I mean, and I'm Charlie's very straight. important. He's very yeah. important. He's a, a student of Pat's and he, uh, he loved Pat. Pat loved him and he's going to be performing. And yes, Saturday night after uh, the last uh, performance, we're going to have a, just a little social get together where everybody could talk and, and, and uh, I'll have a big martini and, <laughs> That's it. Uh, Joe, uh, how, how much is ahead. the? Uh, yeah, how much is the? Uh, for every night, uh, it's ten dollars uh, per night. Per to, to, for the whole night. So you yeah. Can so buy so if you want to see the live stream, it's ten dollars um, a night for that, and you could see all the performances. If you come to the gateway and you have a ticket, it's free. But right. you have to have a ticket. It's very important. Uh, that you don't show up at the door and you don't have a ticket. So well, Matthew Canis put the link on here in the chat. So anybody who wants to uh, get the paper tickets, you can go right to this link and uh, find. And if you go to the um, um, well, in fact, let's put up uh, Lex. Why don't you put up the um, the the URLs where people can go to get this information? Here we go. Um, SouthJerseyJazz.org is where everybody, I mean, I've, I've seen what they have on the website. It's very detailed. It's very uh, user-friendly. You can go there and get and deal with the paper tickets if you want to come in person. You can also, uh, you know, work out uh, uh, about the streams and how much, which ones you want to see and that sort of thing. There's a, there's a, a list of everybody who's playing and, um, we also have Bill Milkowski, uh, his website. It looks great, Bill. That's a wonderful website. Thank and you. He, yeah, and you can pick up his books. He's written <laughs> some fabulous stuff. And get inside the musicians, if you will. And of course, there's the phillyjazzhistory.org, which is the, our website for the, um, for the archives. Now, somebody else just asked a question. Hold on a second. We might be, a, okay. Oh, Charlie Apicella says, I'm playing this. Thank you, Joe. I'm playing These Are Soulful Days and an early Sideman tune Pat played with Jack McDuff, Song of the Soul. Mm. Two great songs. And, you know, I'm but, just realizing, I don't think I mentioned Paul Bolenbach, neither. For all the Paul, Paul Bolenbach fans, he's going to be playing um, on Saturday as well as part of the, uh, the first set. Um, and... Uh, Hopefully I covered everybody. There's a lot of people, you know, he's almost 40. Well, so I have Bill Milkowski there and I know he'll help me out. <laughs> he'll help me out when I forget. Well, I'm gonna be there every night. I'm gonna to try to be there every night, uh, Joe. And I hope everybody who's uh, going to be seeing this, cause this will be coming out on our YouTube channel um, before, 
um, the celebration. So it's going to go out to more people. Let's make this a really special, special weekend. And I think it will be, Joe. You've worked so hard on it. And with Bill there and and John, and and it's going to be great. It really is. Can you something, can you... So, something Pat would be really proud of and probably be embarrassed about, but <laughs> <laughs> but still, probably, you know, it's a good, it's a very good tribute to him, Joe. I got to, you know, I must mention uh, Benedetto Guitars because they're a sponsor as well, uh, and that was Pat's guitar company. Um, that guitar is doing extremely well. Uh, Pat put a lot of time and effort into that instrument. He loved it. And uh, we're thrilled that Benedetto stepped up and helped. He, they're helping us with this because everything is free and we are doing the best we could um, to make everybody comfortable and uh, hopefully they are. Well, I want to thank all of you, Bill Milkowski, John Mulhern, and uh, Joe D'Onofrio, thank you so much for doing this tonight. And uh, we're going to see everybody um, starting on uh, November 4th down the shore. Last but not least, uh, your tax deductible donations will help the community build our archive for everyone to enjoy. As I said before, this is the uh, website where you can donate and uh, every little bit helps. It sure just we're just talking about the digitization of uh, this this extra music that's that you've got, Joe, that John's got, and uh, yeah, my partner Jack McCarthy. We've come up with a lot of tapes from a lot of different people that oh, they should be digitized. They should be saved. You know. Right. So, right. But thank you so much, guys. And uh, thank you, well, Suzanne. We'll, thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll see you on the fourth. Take care, Bye. Bell. Take care, Bye -bye. Joe, John. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thanks, Sam. Bill, John, thank you. Thank you All right, guys.